Robert, welcome to Real Vision. Ash, I'm pumped to be here. Thank you. Well, we're excited to have you. It's your first time on the platform. Uh, you guys are doing a lot of interesting things, a lot to talk about. But first, before we get into what you're doing at Horizon, you've had a really interesting journey into the space, uh, physics, actuarial science, uh, a PhD in finance. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where we are right now. You could say I overinvested in education, but uh, you know it's just the the path that I took and, and what what uh, I think was a little unique for me when I got into Bitcoin. It was uh, relatively early on, and I was actually in Afghanistan, and I, I was doing uh, like data science work in Afghanistan. And what I realized early was there was a big appetite actually for people there, like locals, to get into Bitcoin because they, they realized their local currency just was not very stable, their political system not very stable. So this was just kind of an eye-opening experience for me was like this technology can really benefit people in parts of the world that just have less mature financial systems, political systems, and so forth. Um, so while I was there, I started giving lectures on, on Bitcoin and how to set up a wallet, how to do Monday and things like that, but really important things. And uh, yeah, I actually had at one point a, a choice. I could actually uh, go in bed with an Afghan commando unit or go back for my PhD. I just got married recently, so I took the latter option and I went back for my PhD in finance. I got really lucky at the time to have an academic department that probably as a PhD student thought, let this crazy guy do whatever he wants. So they let me study Bitcoin from an asset pricing perspective. Mm. And then uh, the market started just maturing, or I should say exploding. And by the time I finished my, comp my comps and you know, qualifiers and I was ready to do real research, um, they were actually happy that I was researching in this field. So I actually completed my dissertation on crypto finance. That's an extraordinary story. This is when you were in the, I guess, in the Air Force uh, when you were doing this uh, this uh, work uh, in Afghanistan. What an incredible experience to see uh, a place and be on the ground where obviously there are challenges with valuations and currency, uh, payment rails. Tell us what you learned about the demands or the need uh, or the objective of using money. Yeah, so I mean, in, in Afghanistan and certain parts of the world, there's something called a Hawala network, which is really an informal peer-to-peer, -peer, but person-to-person -person, yeah. uh, payment network. And, and this is something that it is probably a thousand plus years old. I can watch the history of it, but ancient. And it's really based on trust, person-to-person -person trust. I trust my uncle, therefore my uncle's the next node in this person-to-person -person network. What Bitcoin did was basically translate that human peer person to person element to a software peer to peer network, mm. right? So it was, a, it was a natural transition. Now, clearly, you know, uh, there are different levels of technology and access uh, in different parts of the world. So it's not like to the average Afghan person that they, they're kind of uh, using the latest and greatest iPhone and, you know, best broadband technology out there. So access is a bit of a problem. And I think this was really an entrepreneurial problem. So I, I think what really clicked was the peer-to-peer -peer nature of this stuff, moving away from these kind of centralized, you know, monetary systems to one that is actually peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure owned by the users. That clicked. Now it was more of an entrepreneurial problem. How do we build the products to actually bring, you know, these billions of people around the world into our, our ecosystem? What a fascinating idea and analysis. I've looked, I found the Hawala network fascinating. It's something I've looked into. There are mathematical models for how it's represented. It's really interesting. But the intriguing thing to me uh, is that people on the network, it's like you only trust the next person on the network. That trust network uh, is not sort of spread throughout. And as a consequence, the entire network is reliable. And it's amazing that it functions so well and has lasted, as you say, for like a thousand years. It's kind of like one of these evolutionary processes, right? Build something from the ground up that has solid foundations that can actually scale. What an intriguing insight. So then you come back stateside, you start studying mm -hmm. Bitcoin very seriously, obviously at the PhD level. Uh, and what do you learn about the way it's priced? What do you learn about its function during your studies? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, quite unambiguously, there's no such thing as a real asset pricing model for cryptocurrencies at this point, right? And by that, I mean, kind of like a, you know, um, a nominal model of how much these things should intrinsically be worth. We have some ideas for why they have value, and, and that would be a fun topic as well. Um, but what I studied was really kind of relative value across countries. And it started with the just the first fact of 
Bitcoin trades at vastly different prices in different countries, right? So then I started digging deeper, well, why? And then we can start with the, the easiest one that we can probably all think of immediately was, okay, well, frictions to markets. So let's think of capital controls, financial controls, check. That works out, but it doesn't explain the entire, you know, R squared for what's, what explains these differences. And sort of going to other channels. Other channels that were interesting were economic opportunity. So where there are lack, where there is a, a lack of economic opportunity across a broad part of the population, you actually see a higher marginal demand to get into the peer-to-peer -peer, you know, crypto world that we're in, right? So it's kind of an opportunity channel. Then there is one that's maybe a little obvious, but you know, sometimes gets subsumed under the frictions channel, but I, I would call it a, a jurisdictional risk hedging channel. So in countries where you have high you know, volatility, political instability, wars, right? You actually see you know, people um, you know, on the margin crowding into cryptocurrencies and paying higher prices than they do in more stable countries. And then I investigated the tax channel. Are people actually getting to cryptocurrencies because they're evading taxes? And, and interestingly, there's no evidence in the data whatsoever. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.